in an academic context, research is uh, often seen as something found at the opposite end of the spectrum from teaching. Research is often seen as what professors do to avoid teaching or to avoid paying attention to their teaching. Leaves for research mean that you don't have to teach. And of course, the oft used expression that good researchers are often bad teachers. We've all heard these uh, kinds of claims. And what I'd like to do in the next few minutes and what I think uh, the afternoon speakers will do with greater eloquence and at somewhat longer length uh, is to explode this facile dichotomy. Because research and teaching are about as separate as thinking and acting. It's of course possible to do the one without the other, but as we all know, sometimes from painful personal experience, thinking without issue and acting without forethought are at best sterile and at worst dangerous. So let's put aside some of these inherited stereotypes and do some thinking for ourselves about this subject. Research, I propose, has as much its model as Columbus on the Santa Maria or Galileo staring out into the night sky as it does Pasteur looking into his microscope or Braudel hunched over the, manus the microfilms of his archives from Simancas or Dubrovnik. Research is the process of extracting some knowledge one did not before possess from out of the enshrouding, obscuring ignorance. Research is, literally, a voyage of discovery. It is exploration. We share the results of our voyages with our own interested community because it is a way of improving our common conversation. This is what we mean by the word publication. But that questing after the roots of our own ignorance also does something to ourselves, the inquirers. It was not casually that Arnaldo Momigliano, the great historian of the ancient world and the traditions of studying it, called the history of historical scholarship nothing less than the history of how we humans have pursued truth. I think that squarely puts the question of research where it belongs. It is about the quest for truth. When we talk to students in the classroom, as we do to readers whose faces turn to the pages of our work, we are trying to communicate our notion of what is true. Knowledge we know full well is fixed, is not fixed, not final. It is always in a process of re-elaboration in every generation. Why not also in every article or in every class presentation? When Max Weber, in his famous lecture, which I have silently invoked in the title of mine, referred to science, by which he meant systematic knowledge, as a vocation, he ignored completely the problem of research. The word itself appears only once in the lecture, and then glancingly. For him, as indeed in our time, research is such a seemingly obvious activity that no one feels a need to stop and describe it. Having looked for someone to speak on this subject today, the meaning of research or the philosophy of research, and not found him or her after some searching myself, I feel somewhat safe in concluding that there is no such subject today as philosophy of research. In short, it is our blind spot as humanists. So what are the consequences of professors being unwilling or unable to explain what research is? And I don't mean uh, uh, a retired biologist talking about what he or she did in the laboratory. I mean serious systematic thinking about what it is that research is. Well, for one thing, it means there is no one to defend what it is we do to our uncomprehending external critics. For instance, the not un, uh, uncommon view that research is somehow a luxury that can be pared away in an age of austerity. For another, it means that professors themselves may lack a self-consciousness about their own practice, which must, in the end, have an impact on the quality of what they do. Third, without any engagement with research as a problem, 
there is no way to make better intellectual institutions, places where the passion for discovery is shared as comprehensively and effectively with students in the classroom as it is with colleagues through a book or journal or indeed with strangers in the halls of a gallery. Finally, it is only this spirit of research, of constant pursuit of what it is that we do not know that can keep an institution like a person young at mind. Open to inquiring means being also open to change. Whereas most institutions, like most people, fear change. The research mentality, if we can use that term, accepts that change is a natural feature of constant investigation. It has often been said that the only book one ever writes about which one feels completely happy is the one written in a field you have stopped working in. <laughs> and the same is true for institutions. Now, I keep these two volumes on my desk to remind me of this mission of ours. They are, to my mind anyway, at once the saddest and the most exciting books in this building. The title, Research Institutes, Their History, Organization, and Goals. Edited by Ludolf Brauer, Albrecht Mendelssohn Bartholdi, and Adolf Meyer, published in Hamburg in 1930. What do they contain? The first volume is a history and analysis of institutes or institutions focused on research across all fields from antiquity to the beginning of the 20th century. And the second volume, as you can see much thicker, is a gazetteer with articles written about all of the research institutes uh, in Germany uh, and the German-speaking lands, including uh, familiar names to us, uh, Frederick Pollock writing about the Institute for Sozialforschung, uh, and uh, Fritz Zoxel writing about the Warburg Library in Hamburg. So they are the saddest, of course, because the world that they describe full of potential and intellectual daring was destroyed three years later, many of the people scattered, if not uh, murdered. They are the most exciting as well, because reading through these volumes, even at a distance of uh, 80 years, one is staggered by the exciting work being done and by the real breaking of boundaries, the questions that took no mind for the kinds of divisions which uh, we still live with today. And that, in fact, brings us back to today uh, and all of us in this room, because in some real sense, it is that interrupted story that we and this institution are connecting with. Of the disruptions that have occurred and the rupture they represent, of course, we can do nothing. But on this one little point about the role of research in a world of academic creativity and about the role of the Institute as the agent of innovation, I think on this point we do connect with the various institutes mentioned uh, in these long forgotten and unknown books. So if we come back to the question which I let hang before, what is the meaningfulness or the philosophy of research? Uh, the fact that there was no one to, uh, to bring in to answer the question means, and I think all of us as researchers understand, that when a question draws a blank, that itself determines the question. And so we could envision the papers to come as, in some sense, the beginning of a research project trying to outline what the contours of the meaningfulness of research might, in fact, be. In the, uh, in the preface to these volumes from 1930, the editors saw the Institute as a new potential solution to the problem of the rigidity of old institutions, such as the university. One might think, perhaps, of the Institute uh, with its problem-based scope, its cross-disciplinary platform, its institutional multimediality, exhibitions, research, teaching, as perhaps the monastery of the future preserving and protecting uh, in dark times. I myself would prefer not to have such a negative view of things, but to think of it 
more positively as a laboratory or a think tank where together creative scholarship can reshape the future. And the talks that follow will each present some aspect of this. Uh, the first talk from Joachim Nettelbeck will deal with the very complex question of how one creates the appropriate culture for an institution devoted to intellectual creativity. Harriet Zuckerman will then help us think about how we evaluate what counts as good basic research, not applied research. Michael Shanks will take us through the question of what a life of research might look like to the researcher. And Larry Wolf will bring us right back again to this question of how it is that a life of this kind of investigation and pursuit informs and makes for the best kind of teaching. So that is the outline of what we will encounter over the next couple of hours. Our first speaker, Joachim Nettelbeck, was born in Mannheim in 1944. He studied jurisprudence and sociology in Freiburg and Breisgau. From 1971 to 78, he was administrative director of the Berlin School of Economics. He earned his doctorate in 1978-79 on the appointment of instructors of higher education in the Federal Republic of Germany and in France. From 1981 onwards, he was the founding secretary of the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin, uh, and he remained in that position until his retirement in the year 2012. During his time in Paris, he met Clemens Heller, who was uh, a refugee from Austria, studied at Harvard, back to Europe after the war, became a good friend of Fernand Braudel uh, and his partner in establishing the sixth section of the École Pratique des Hautes Études and the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, uh, which uh, Heller ran after Braudel's retirement. And if Heller is the most important academic administrator of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, then I think it is certainly accurate to say that Nettelbeck is the most important academic administrator of the past 30 years. Uh, not only what he has done at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, but after the fall of the Berlin Wall, he was the leader in establishing institutes for advanced study in Budapest, uh, in Bucharest, also in Zurich, in Sweden, in St. Petersburg, and in Bamako, in Mali. Uh, and through his leadership behind the scenes, shaped an institution which in many ways uh, is exemplary uh, in the academic world of today for fostering the kind of intellectual creativity across fields and disciplines that many of us in other places can only aspire to. And so it's a great honor to invite Joachim Nettelbeck to this podium. <laughs> 